Hello and welcome to this episode of Demystified as we explore home cooking in a modern world. Hello, I'm Linda and I'm here with my friend Paul. Hello. That was no notice, I just started. No, no, you just started. Sorry, you were pulling a face and I just started. How are you, Paul? I'm all right. We were discussing a topic and obviously you've come up with something, but you decided not to tell me. Well, like most, I just like to spring it on you because uh, that's the kind of person I am. (laughs) Um, No, no, we were, we'll come back to you, but we were talking a little while ago about cakes and volumes and, um, and and I had said that I'd made a sponge and I really wanted to perfect a kind of simple cake that you could not knock up quickly, but one that you kind of could go to with confidence and say, I've got someone I want to impress coming around or a a favourite auntie or someone and do that little uh, plain cake with uh, lemon icing. Okay, yeah. And you, uh, and I were talking about it and you gave me the, well, how did you, like you weren't happy with your mix, but are you happy with your basic standard sponge mix because if you can nail a standard sponge mix you can nail anything and I thought okay this is a good time to explore that so off the top Mm. I know you like baking less this week because that's all you've been doing but normally you um I don't mind baking you have a good history of baking yeah but um for a standard Sponge mm-hmm. mix that you can then start to develop from there. I, it's yours. Uh, I don't have one. Well, I know you're like, <laughs> <laughs> there goes, okay, well, thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> the world's shortest podcast, one minute and 49 seconds. Um, but I know you like Madeira cake. Yeah, that's true. Not a sponge, I don't know, but, but as a sponge. Um, so, uh, I do recall, and this is a long time, like a really long time ago, um, when I first started cooking. So, this is pre being an apprentice. So, oh, wow. left okay. school and was working as a kitchen hand for two little bit Looney Tunes, an Argentinian couple. Who I think at the time I thought were like 50 and they were probably only like 30. (laughs) Um, And they used to, and we worked in a, underneath a shopping, little shopping strip in like a bunker. And they'd set up a a bakery in there and were doing all manner of uh, sort of Argentinian recipes but a lot of layered cakes and gattos and things like that. And at the time, it was very, like, really trendy. And they were selling to all the nice um, bakeries in the city and big hotels. And they were quite spectacular, um, these particular these particular cakes. But I remember the first cake that I did with them was a lemon sponge. So I like a lemon sponge... And the reason I do is because I think that lemon helps cut the sugar. So as much as I'm a sweet tooth to a degree, I actually like something that isn't overly sweet. Um, And one of the sort of baseline things, now I'm not saying this works all the time because there is a lot of variation in ingredients, but you can essentially put equal quantities of butter, sugar, eggs, and flour, and make a sponge. So 200 grams of butter, 200 grams of sugar, 200 grams of eggs, 200 grams of flour. Now, it can, depending on your ingredients and stuff, it can vary. I'm not suggesting, look, if you want to try it, absolutely try it. It, There are ways to get a fluffier sponge, but if you're looking for something to just bash out without even thinking about it, and quite often they're the recipes that a lot of people want to do is maybe not refer to the recipe book, um, something that has equal quantities and equal portions um, is much easier to remember. And I will always 
at it. And it's about the only time I use lemon zest. I see lemon zest in a lot of things. You know, people put it in dressings. I find it um, not super palatable, but when you... Mm, like peeling fruit buns. Yeah. I don't like peeling fruit buns. But when you... manufacturers take it out. When you zest it very finely on like a microplane and then bake it, it seems to break down a little bit. But I certainly think the addition of citrus in a sponge would say, while I don't have a go-to... That will always be part of my list of ingredients, whether it be lemon or orange or lime or whatever. So if you've got equal quantities of those ingredients, what would you then put as a quantity for some lemon? Uh, In that scenario, maybe depending on the size of the lemon, maybe half a lemon, the zest of half a lemon. You don't need a lot. It's pretty, And as long as you don't zest the, the, get into the pith, you just want the outside. So you see a lot of people when they get their microplane, they really sort of rub at it quite hard. It's a very light touch, very, very light touch. So you just let the tool do the work. But yeah, for a sponge, that can you, that can work. Generally, I will pare back the sugar and the eggs a little bit. Um, so I might end up with about 160, 140 grams of sugar. But in reality, like if you just want to bash out something it's not going to be the most spectacular thing but you just want to bash something out you can pretty much follow that and it will work just cream your butter and your sugar add the eggs one at a time fold through the flour stick it in a buttered cake tin bake it about 160 degrees it'll take about half an hour maybe 40 minutes and you'll have a cake you don't sound um you'll have a cake yeah well the reason i ask because i i mean see this is the thing with baking right so it's very hard to convince, especially some people from the older generation, that there's better ways. So I remember visiting um, the grandmother of someone that I knew over in Adelaide who used to bake outside. She had a gas oven set up under the eaves in a little patio outside and she mixed everything by hand there was no electronic mixes everything was done with a wooden spoon and a Mm. plastic bowl she by far and away is the best baker i've ever experienced everything was that good like her short Mm. crust pastry was so short it just melted in your mouth her sponges were super light like sometimes you just can't mimic that with no. a with a written recipe like you need to see that person do that and so that's the thing with something like a sponge if you get a base like that 200 200 200 base if you actually mess around with that you might actually get yourself to a point where you're like yeah that's perfect for me the first time i ever made a sponge now that you brought that up was that my grandma was down and i was in my early teens probably yeah 12 13 and Grandma said, okay, I'll teach you to make a sponge because her, her cakes were always amazing. Yeah. And it was in a plastic bowl with a wooden spoon and I thought my right arm yeah. was going to drop off. And every time I said, Grandma, please, she's like, no, no, keep going. I'd be like, oh. But it did turn out. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily but, saying that that's the no, better no, way to do it. it. Like, like, well, no one's going to stand there for as long yeah. as we would do it now. But the reason I ask is that I'm seeing um, one of my... I'm seeing my uncle... And his partner, the last time I saw them soon, the last time I saw them, when we left uh, on my last trip up to New South Wales, they didn't leave until really late afternoon. And on the spur of the moment, my uncle invited us around for a morning tea. So I knew that by the time they drove an hour and a half home, they wouldn't have had a lot of time. And yet we rolled up the next morning at nine o'clock and there was the most amazing uh, plain sponge with lemon icing and about three other things that she yeah. turned out and I just thought wow you know this is and you know cold meats and cheese yeah. and I just thought she's you know like catered for 30 people and it was just Dougie and me but it was uh, but your lemon icing like that's a classic yeah and it was just so lovely and yeah. I thought I'd love to be able to just start off on the lemon icing well, that's and uh, sponge cake but my sponge wasn't so sponge as more Dense. Ah, yeah, it was not yeah. very good. But lemon icing is lemon juice and mm. what uh, our American friend called powdered sugar, but we call it icing sugar. Um, 
I will. There's one thing with powdered sugar. You see, pure in what we see over here is pure icing sugar, and then you'll see icing mixture. Uh, they will give you two different end results because icing mixture has corn flour in it. Oh, so it can thicken it up. Well, it's it gets that crust on top of it, and it sets a bit harder. Now, powdered sugar will still do that, but mm. not as hard. I will always use, I always use powdered sugar, not icing mixture. If I want to change the consistency of it, well, I can do that other ways. But yeah, just so when you buy your icing sugar, there are just there are two different things. Pure icing sugar will still make an icing, just because it says icing mixture doesn't mean it's better. I actually find it not to be as good. The only problem is is pure icing sugar. If it's not kept properly, will develop lumps and stuff like that. And you have to sift it and mess around. But uh, just that and lemon juice. There's yeah. there's lemon icing. I mean, and you can put melted butter in there, and you can do it various other things. But and really, the funny thing is, is you can have a big bowl of powdered icing sugar, and you go, oh, okay, I need quite a bit of liquid. Sometimes it's the juice of one lemon that is enough because it just it's lighter. You know, it's mm-hmm. super light, and it just breaks down as soon as you add a liquid to it. So yeah, but like you say, I mean. In essence, six ingredients, and you can have a your sponge cake with lemon icing. Yeah, nice and you've used the outside of the lemon and the inside. Hmm. A nice simple meal, but I, a nice simple yeah. cake, but it's not uh, something I've been able to perfect so far. And the other trick for, for um, sponge cakes is salt. So I generally will use unsalted butter. But add salt. So any time I do a dessert, I add salt, actually. So I know it's sort of known now, but previously it wasn't known. So back with my old Argentinian friends, um, it was learned, you know, I was just learning how to cook. It was quite shocking to me to put salt in everything that I was making, which was sweet. Like, but it, it, it enhances the flavour. A pinch? Yeah, a, a reasonable pinch. Okay. Like, you know, 200 grams of flour, sort of uh, three to seven grams of salt, somewhere in there, is, you know, so is like enough. A quarter to a half a teaspoon, sort of. Yeah, I don't work in those. I know you don't. Those mediums. But I'm trying to convert them. I know. <laughs> into, I know you don't. But yeah, and then you can go off on all sorts of tangents. If you get yourself a base icing, a base sponge, <clears throat> of course, you can then cut it in half and fill it with cream and jam and mm. fresh berries or whatever um, you can soak them of course for trifle for try. well I mean there's a yeah I mean, your sponge doesn't necessarily have to be in a tall cake tin so I used to you with some sponge recipes it will vary but if you look at the ingredients they're kind of similar um, if you lay your sponge mixture out on a large flat tray and spread it out so it's nice and flat and bake it like that. In essence, you can make a roulard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's another way you can go about your same recipe. So jam roll, and that's another thing from our childhood past. Well, that's a rule. Yeah, that's a roulard. Yeah. 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 But uh, the uh, who was it? The was it a baker? Was it? Oh, was I can't it remember. Something. Yeah, but you go along if you're going out for afternoon tea somewhere fancy. Yeah, you'd pick up the little jam rolls. In fact, yeah, the one thing that I have to do actually, which I've been planning on doing, my father, um, who wasn't a cook at all, like would just torture meat on the barbecue. Like it was just now that I look back, he just he was a rubbish cook. Um, he had a thing for Boston buns. Now, I don't know if they've got, oh, got yeah. anything to do with Boston at all. <laughs> but over here at a big chain bakery store. Yeah. Uh, oh, quite a few, really. Yeah, quite a few. There was always... The, and he'd go on a Saturday morning and get a Boston bun. So I think we might have to do a Boston bun on the website. It can't be that hard. Um, but that's that sort of sweet, bready, icing, sugar, that really Walmart. Thick. Yeah, that was fondant. I don't even know how much fondant it is around anymore so fondant's a type of icing um and it's white generally mm. i know people use fondants for decorating cakes but they're like a paste they're much thicker um 
back in the day, back, back in my pastry cooking days, we would get buck, and it came in buckets, like 20 litre buckets of fondant. Wow. Um, and you could do what it like. There are various things you could do with it, but I distinctly remember putting fondant on a lot of things. But it wasn't a chocolate based fondant. It was always just fondant. And I think a it had. Sprinkle of coconut on top. Had corn starch, mm. uh, oh. corn syrup in it, and a oh. butt ton of sugar. Like it was just sugar overload. But obviously it's still around if they're still doing Boston buns because that's not pure icing mixture. That's fondant. It's, it's, while it may well have similar ingredients, it's different. And it sets up differently and it's quite sort of almost like mozzarella cheesy when you pull it apart. It's mm, kind of stringy. Okay, yeah. Um, but yeah, look, anyway, so from your standard sponge, you can, you know, do lots of things. You could do that roulard type, you know, lay it out flat and then you could certainly, only because you told me that you bought a trifle dish the other day, <laughs> um, you could certainly cut a circle out of that and do mm. a few layers of, sponge in your trifle rather than just a single sponge Ooh. layer um <clears throat> all, all manner of things you can cut it into strips and put it around a ice cream cake or you know mm. it can be anything so if you get yourself a standard recipe um yeah it could be anything you wanted and quite often what you can do is if you want something a little bit flatter just substitute self-raising flour for plain flour in the same quantities. If you don't want that rise out of it, you don't want it to be too high, so you want something nice and flat because you're going to do something else with it, throw in plain flour. The eggs will still give it some lift, but not as much as self-raising flour. So, yeah, from a standard sponge mix, whatever your standard sponge mix might be, it can be any number of things. Of course, it can be a sponge. Well, after our discussion And I think passion trifles, fruit dressing was the passion was the old school one, mm. not lemon. I think proper old school was passion fruit dressing. We used oh, to have, icing. Grandma used to put uh, passion fruit icing on a sponge, if yeah. she, but her preference was uh, just a sprinkling of icing sugar yeah. with the cream and um, yeah. jam or fruit in in the in the middle there when she's making a sponge. One thing I have noticed too, when people do cut their you see all these chef shows and they cut their sponge perfectly in half. Got a couple of little tips for people and it's kind of hard to explain without showing you. But if you get a ruler and measure the height of your sponge and find the halfway point, just stick a bamboo skewer in there and then work your way around and stick about eight bamboo skewers in the halfway point and then just run your knife along the first bamboo skewer. Make sure it's a nice long serrated knife and the blade of the knife will sit on the bamboo skewers and you'll get a perfect cut in half and you just take out the bamboo skewers. Well, okay. I thought there was a... Okay, they then use some cotton and they... Yeah, I, there, there are tools ways. which you can okay. use, but I was thinking for the home That's cook. Easy. yeah. Because like... And I, I don't have one of those tools here, but I did, recently did a cake where or something where I needed to do that, cut it in perfect half. Um... Because half the thing with the sponge too is not only the texture, but it's the quantity, if we're talking that sort of old school sponge, it's the quantity of cream in the middle to sponge. Because mm -hmm. that matters. Yes. Too much and you're not getting enough sponge. Too mm -hmm. little and it's like, too cakey. Mm -hmm. Like even though the sponge could be light as a feather, so it's, it's a really fine line. Um, is there a rule? Is there a shift uh, rule like no. this? I'm sure that like Country Women's Association would have rules about it. Like, yeah. you know, when you go out to the CWA bake meats out in the country, um, I'm sure there's rules and regulations around how much cream is too much and all the rest of it. Yeah. But yeah, I that's a that's one thing. Is if you can get your sponge cut perfectly in half, it always looks nicer too. Yeah. Um, and if you're going to replace, if you want to make it a chocolate sponge, you just add in a little bit and take away, add in the cocoa and take away a little bit of the flour or just add in a bit of the cocoa? Um, or it very much depends. You don't really, you, cocoa won't stabilize it like flour will. It doesn't have gluten in it, right? So, um, yeah, you could probably take away a little bit, but, you know, if you're adding... 50 grams let's say of 
cocoa powder. Um, use unsweetened Dutch cocoa powder if you can, because it's better quality. Um, you wouldn't necessarily take away 50 grams of, of flour just because you're adding the cocoa powder. You could. You could try it, but I'm not sure what it would do to the mixture. What would I, you do? Um, I'd probably take maybe about 25 grams of flour off and just leave the cocoa powder at 50 grams if that's if we're working off our sort of 200, 200 basis. Um, it's very hard for me to say because I don't want people going out there and doing it and then it fails and then they get upset. So I Because I haven't tried that. Okay. Um, no, that's fair enough. And, that, and the other thing is, is to also be cautious about adding... Uh, if you want to make a chocolate cake, be cautious about adding melted chocolate to to cakes, depending on what you're making. Like a mud cake, it's okay. Um, but if you're looking for something light and fluffy and da da da, melted chocolate's probably not your best bet because you're cooking it at high temperature. It makes it bitter, mm-hmm. like really, really uber bitter. So you're better off with a little bit of cocoa powder. And it's funny how deceiving it is, actually. Because cocoa powder doesn't have a very strong chocolate taste in of itself. But when you eat a sponge cake that's had cocoa powder made with it, your brain tells you that it tastes like chocolate, where it actually doesn't. Oh, hang on. It may well a little bit, but... No? Not, no. Well, think about something like a brownie, right? Brownie's got both mm-hmm. cocoa powder and melted chocolate in the mixture that's very chocolate heavy flavor right Mm -hmm. take away the melted chocolate from a brownie mixture and then taste it it will still taste chocolatey right to a degree but the color is a lot to do with how you perceive the taste oh another topic for another day i think Mm. but we we might try we might do a see the Realistically, 50 grams in two, four, six, eight, a, a kilo, let's say, of mixture, mm-hmm. if we do our two, 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 200 mm-hmm. grams of each ingredient, and 50 grams within that of good quality Dutch cocoa will give a little bit of that choc- chocolate flavour, but more so your brain is telling you because of the colour of it that it's chocolate. That it's chocolate chocolate cake. Which is why you'll see a lot of chefs these days when they're doing maybe more some of that sort of molecular cooking or molecular cuisine is um, they'll create something that's clear or white or uh, a colour that isn't associated with the flavour. So, you know, you might get a white part of a dessert, right? It looks clear. Like, let's say a jelly. We were talking mm-hmm. about jellies recently. And... It may well be mint. Oh yeah, yeah. And you taste mint, mm. but it kind of you're kind of like, hang on a second. Yeah. But your brain's telling you it should be green because well, like that's what you associate. Well, like your Christmas uh, birthday cake, when it was the pink layer or the red layer. I yeah, it was all. It was going to taste mint. Yeah. My brain was saying it should be strawberry or fruity, yeah. but it was mint. Yeah. And then the next layer was mint. Yeah. And I thought, but hmm, there's a theme going here. Yeah, well, that's what he asked for. But it shows you how yeah. much what you see associates yeah, exactly. with what you yeah. taste. Yeah, exactly. So that'll be, we might do that one actually. We might make two sponge cakes with equal quantities of ingredients, and one will put cocoa powder in, and one we won't. And I, I imagine that we're both going to sit here and go, no, that tastes like a chocolate. Mm. That tastes like chocolate cake. Yeah. But how much does it really? If we blindfolded it, I might blindfold oh, no. you. That'd not be gonna, better. I'm not going to film that one. No, but that might be yeah. the best way to do it. We've got a few yeah. people in the office here. We'll blindfold them. Yeah. Give them, <laughs> give them a, give it a little try of sponge cake yeah. and a little try of sponge cake made with cocoa powder. Mm. See if they can tell. See if they can tell. Because I'd be surprised. Like you might get a hint, yeah. but for that sort of quantity. I'd be very surprised. I think a lot of that comes down to with what you see. Okay. Well, it's going to be interesting to to, uh, taste test that. Mm. Well, thank you. So I knew you'd have something to say about sponges. Well, not probably not as much as like, yeah, we did a, I've tried, we did some steamed sponges, very early doors. Mm -hmm. Um, Different, totally different texture works. 
It was. It wasn't. They were. I love the. They were th- like the chocolate one is fantastic when you add eggs. Oh that, well, that's not a sponge not a as sponge, such. But it's a cake, and it's, it's a fantastic, cake. and it is really light, and it lasts for days, and yeah. it's still moist after days. But I did that do a. Fantastic. I did do a more traditional sponge, which we steamed, which had textually nothing to do with that sort of nice, light, airy, sort of. Mm. See, and that's the other thing. It's the word you associate, you use with it that also associates your expectation, yeah, right? So when you true. say sponge, you're you're thinking something sort of bouncy and super airy and super light. And blah, 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 blah. Well, for those who live in Brunswick, we're all thinking probably Sandy Green. Yeah, Green Refectory. Green Refectory, isn't she the best? Like, Queen of sponge. Totally. Yeah. And vanilla slices. Yeah. But if you don't live in Brunswick, you might not know. But I'm sure we all have our local favourite. Yeah. That would be mine. But no, the steamed one we did, it followed a pretty traditional recipe, but textually it was like, because it didn't, it didn't get exposed to high heat and we weren't cooking a lot of the moisture out, because remember in a cake you've got eggs, sugar, which turned to liquid, uh, and butter. So you cook a lot of that moisture out to a degree. When you steam it, it's a totally different reaction. So you get a, a denser to a degree, the cake is a little bit more dense, but it's got really good, solid, buttery flavour, which is what I actually liked about it. Mm. So while it wasn't as spongy or as light and fluffy, it's not to say that it's right or wrong, it's still a sponge of sorts, but it's just not super spongy. So, yeah. But that's... No, we did that ages ago. That was a Queen Victoria, steamed Queen yeah, Victoria sponge. Yeah, yeah. And it was good. It wasn't like that super light and fluffy. And it was a, made a Queen Victoria sponge by not the fact that it's a sponge, it's all the other stuff that goes with it that makes it a Queen Victoria sponge. Anyway, sorry, I'm rambling. <laughs> it's late in the day. Well, thank you for that. And um, Sponges. I look forward to... Uh, well, I think we should... Yeah, this is a good time to be making sponges, I think, coming up to sharing, taking things around to people's houses sharing and if it's a bit lighter i get a bit overwhelmed by some of the really big heavy cakes that people like to make and that's just not my favorite thing yeah yes dougie more chocolate more layers more cream more ice cream more he whatever he can get yeah whereas i'm much more the uh madeira type light sponge yeah but you see madeira is a like really good example right because that's a super heavy dense cake yeah but light in flavor yeah not overwhelming. Yeah, very simple, mm. buttery, lemony. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the questions I get asked more than anything else when I'm demonstrating and cooking in front of people is what are my sort of, you know, shop board things that are my weakness? And like, I only have a few. Madeira cake is one. Mm-hmm. Potato gems. But I was going to say potato <laughs> gems. <laughs> like, I, I, I have made them. I don't know how to make them. Oh, but- um, and they like homemade ones are really good, like really good. I think uh, in America they're called tater tots. They are um, tater tots. So they're mm-hmm. they're my weakness. Serena tin tuna olive in Italian olive oil, love that, and QP mayonnaise. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're my weakness things, but Madeira cake is like for me. You did make one. It, and it you just inhaled. wasn't as... Yeah, but it yeah, wasn't but know, anywhere near... No, I didn't inhale it. I just didn't give any just, to you. No, well, that's... Hmm, I did notice. That well, the gone. recipe is on the website and you're no more special <laughs> than anyone else. So log on and but you can watch a you? video. And I there's was, this guy there who runs you I through was, the entire process. It's really quite a unique I was idea. Watching, I was watching um, that dude make ice cream and then I got interrupted. That was interesting. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that so all, while we've got everyone here, we should tell them. So all the recipes that we've been talking about over the last few weeks are up on the website mm-hmm. now. Great. Um, including a tutorial on ice cream. And some may say, why would we be cooking with steam, be doing an ice cream tutorial? Because you can do the perfect creme anglaise in your steam oven, mm-hmm. which is three quarters of the battle to doing a good ice cream. Um, and... Mm-hmm. Starting tomorrow, but we can tell people now, we're doing a book promotion. The end of COVID-19. No, the end of the 2021 COVID-19 year. 
Yes, well. I don't think COVID's 1919. ended. Well, we're trying ended. to. We're trying to wish it away. Yeah. So we've put 19.19% off Discount off the, the price book. of the book. Um, and we can't do it for overseas because we didn't know how to do that with... Um, well, no, you didn't get organised down Amazon there Amazon and uh, Noble, Barnes & Noble, but... Um, We'll try to work something out no, with that if, in time. Yeah, so but you can still, if people want yeah. to, they can still order. Um, it's just so, like the postage is horrendous if you're outside of us. Yeah, so what I've done is I've posted a link to the newsletter, which has the QR discount code mm-hmm. on our Facebook page. Oh, great. I'll also, in the not-too-distant future, just post the QR code on the Facebook page. It may seem a bit weird to go, how am I going to scan my QR code when I'm looking at it on my phone, you might need to log on to your laptop or desktop and use your phone to scan the code. I know it's a bit weird, but we're just playing around with QR codes. It's Linda's new toy. <laughs> <laughs> so she's QR yeah, coding yeah, ev- she's QR that. coding everything. I know. Um, so that'll send you straight through. You won't need to put in a discount discount coupon or code or anything like that. It's just all there That's it. ready yeah, to go. So jump on Facebook. The newsletter is there with an update of and links to all the new recipes, um, and obviously that that QR code discount for the book over the next two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, because that that means we can get them in. We can't. The, yeah, we can't guarantee that. Well, we don't know when Australia Post will yeah. deliver. Anywho, but um, it the gives offer us, ends the fifteenth at yeah. midnight. Yeah. Mm. So, jump on. Good Christmas present. Great Christmas present. Don't know if there's any sponge recipes in there, but there is that good chocolate cake, the simple chocolate cake. Yes. So, and that's a good starter for anyone with a steam oven. That's always a. Uh, there's always a. Uh, in fact, we've just got an order come through now for a book. Oh, there you go. Oh my gosh, we better hold it off until tomorrow and try <laughs> to get the discount. Well, thanks for listening, everybody, and thank you for sharing Paul on sponges. Thanks, Linda. And I'm always motivated to go home and cook, except when I get home, I'm a bit tired. But. Happy cooking out there, everybody, and um, until next time. See you later. See you later. Thanks for listening to this podcast as we explore home cooking in a modern world. We'd love you to subscribe, and for more information, please go to our website, cookingwithsteam.com.